you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Esther chapter 9 as we close out our series uh, in the book of Esther. And since this is the Lord's Supper Sunday, I wanted to uh, relate a, a festival and celebration that the Jewish people commemorate with uh, what we do here this morning as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And so we're talking about the importance of uh, ritual, the importance of ritual. And we'll be looking at Esther chapter 9 in your Bibles. Now, uh, when uh, we lived in Ohio, our family had a a ritual every uh, year around Christmas time. Usually it was shortly after Thanksgiving because everybody was uh, pushing me to make sure we did this family ritual. And we would uh, gather as a family, get in the car, and uh, we would drive to, uh, from Logan, Ohio, to Somerset, Ohio. Somerset's a pretty uh, town there in, in central Ohio. And uh, we would uh, go out into the country, outside of Somerset, and we would go to the Christmas tree farm. And there at the Christmas tree farm, we would uh, get on a wagon that was uh, drawn by horses, and we would ride out with other people out to uh, where all the Christmas trees were growing. And uh, then they would say, uh, we'll be back in a half an hour. Uh, Be sure to uh, be at this spot and we'll pick you up. And so uh, we would uh, go out as a family. We'd all run all over the place looking for the perfect Christmas tree. And that was a wonderful uh, time. And of course, uh, it was a time of the year where it was very cold. It was usually uh, snow on the ground or maybe uh, flurries uh, falling, and uh, we would finally find the tree we wanted. We gave us a little saw, and we used a hand saw to cut it down, and then we would uh, drag the tree back to the spot where the uh, horse-drawn trailer would come and, and uh, pick us up. And so we would get on the wagon, and then we would go to uh, uh, back to the place where they would wrap the tree, get it ready for us to put on the car. But while we were waiting for them to wrap the tree, there was always the ritual of uh, taking the hot cider they had available and drinking the hot cider and uh, standing around talking to other people and uh, waiting for our tree to be prepared. And then we'd load the tree on top of the car and uh, we would uh, head back to Somerset, the city, and once we uh, got into uh, the city, we would go to Anthony's Pizza. Remember that, Andrew? And uh, had the best pizza in the area. And we'd go in there and order a big pizza, and we would eat the pizza. And then we'd drive home, and of course, it was my responsibility to put the Christmas tree up. But that was a ritual we practiced for many years, uh, probably from the time Andrew was born and until the time we uh, left to move down here to Florida. And it was a family ritual that uh, made Christmas seem more exciting, made it uh, seem meaningful to us, and helped us to celebrate that holiday together and prepare our spirits and minds for uh, what the meaning of Christmas was all about. Well, ritual is something that all of us practice. Now, we're Baptist, and so we're part of that tradition from the Reformation that kind of just said, we don't need all those rituals, we don't need liturgy. Matter of fact, the way this building is right now, uh, with all the big, bright, open windows and so on, that is a result of the Reformation because we did away with all the candles and all the incense, with all, did away with all the statues, did away with all the uh, ornate decorations and the high cathedral ceilings, and, and uh, we did away with all that because we felt like that was uh, Catholic and popish, and so we as Baptists don't want anything to do with that. Uh, and uh, we uh, kind of prided ourselves in the idea that we don't need those rituals those Catholics practice, right? All right, some of you still have that meaning, right? Yeah, we're not like the Catholics, are we? I don't, uh, well, maybe we have our own rituals. Uh, let's, let's see, do we have rituals? Well, we start out the service with songs, and we sing, depending on the church, three or four songs, maybe a couple songs, and we have an opening prayer, and and then we have maybe a greeting time, and uh, then we have some more songs, and then comes a time where scripture's read, and the pastor gets up and preaches, 
And then we have a what? An altar call invitation. And, uh, and maybe before that we have an offering or after that we have an offering and then we close out the service. So we have a, a three-point system of worship that came out of the old revivalism of the 1800s. You didn't know that, did you? You should have known that because I taught that several years ago and you should have learned that, okay? But we, we have our own rituals. We go through those things, but we don't call them rituals because we do them. And you have rituals too, don't you? And how important are our church rituals? Well, I still have a battle between should we have the offering before the sermon or should we have the offering after the invitation? And some of you are going, well, I know which side I stand on. Why is that so important to you? Because the ritual you practice may be not be happening in this church the way you want it to happen. And so that's why we have culture wars and battle. Uh, uh, worship wars and things like that because uh, people have different ways of doing things. They have their own rituals they become used to. And uh, rituals of types of songs are just as important as other types of rituals as well. Some people like praise choruses. Other people like old hymns. Other people uh, don't care. They kind of mix it all up. Rituals are part of our lives. We don't call them rituals. It's just things we do. I'm sure every one of you has a ritual when you get up in the morning, Amen. right? Yes. Okay. I remember uh, one time uh, years ago, I, I don't know how old I was, I saw Johnny Carson on TV. How many remember Johnny Carson? Okay. And he was talking to Ed McMahon, and uh, Johnny Carson was talking about how, um, you know, he goes through a routine when he gets up in the morning, and he talked about his routine, and he says, and I put on my shoes and my socks, and then, then I, I put my pants on. And everybody in the audience went, what, what? And they're all laughing, and he, he's looking around like, what's so funny? And Ed goes, you put your shoes and socks on before you put your pants on? That was Johnny's routine. That was his ritual. You may do it different, but all of us have these personal rituals we go through, except we just don't call them that. And there's certain things we do out of habit, out of routine, that have become so accustomed uh, to our lives that we don't even think about those things anymore. We just do them. And families have those rituals, like our Christmas ritual, our family did. And those are good things. I learned when I was a pastor in Ohio, you don't plan revivals in August. When I first went there, I had this big revival planned, and, and the people finally pulled me aside and said, uh, you can't do that, preacher. I said, why not? I, they said, because nobody will come. I said, I don't understand. What's wrong with August? Uh, that's traditionally revival time. Well, not around here, preacher. That's not, because that's family reunion time. And everybody's going to be gone. I said, you mean there's nobody going to be in worship? Oh, yeah, yeah, on the off Sundays when their family reunions aren't going on. And heaven forbid the person was divorced because they had four family reunions, you know. So it was, a, it was just a custom of that age. So I, I learned to adjust and put our revival time later. Amen? Amen. And so ritual is part of our lives. It's something that we do. And uh, the word rite is another term we use. A rite is a formal procedure in a, a religious or a solemn observance. And we go through that rite, like a funeral, for instance, a funeral rite. And uh, a ritual is how you do that rite. It's the prescribed action or words of that rite. So ritual is the way of doing things to observe the rite. And, and in rituals, especially when it has to do with a rite, there are symbolic meanings that are acted out. And the, and the ritual uh, is a symbolic action within itself. For instance, when we baptize people here in the baptistry and we immerse them underwater, we say a little formula. We say, buried with him in baptism or raised to walk in newness of life. So what is that? It's depicting what happened to Jesus. Jesus died, he was crucified and buried, and then he rose again on the third day. 
And so when we uh, go, go through our baptism, we're saying we're, we're being buried to the old life and being raised to a new life. It's acting out symbolically what Jesus has already done in our hearts. He, he, he took us away from the old life. He, he made us born again. He gave us a new birth. And so we have been resurrected from the dead. We're no longer spiritually dead. Now we're alive in Christ. And so the ritual of immersion conveys the meaning of the action done by Christ in the conversion process. Now, anthropologists tell us that we use ritual actions to bring order, continuity, and meaning to our existence. In other words, life would be so dull and boring if we didn't have rituals that uh, we, we just wouldn't be able to survive. We'd become apathetic, and we would just, you know, go through the motions and not enjoy life at all. So we've created rituals that will help us find meaning and purpose in life. And uh, birthdays, for instance, are rituals. You celebrate your birthday to celebrate another year of life. Christmas is a ritual. That's a celebration we as a Christian church celebrate. Um, Sunday dinners can be a ritual. Some families all meet together on Sunday. They have a big meal as a family, and they sit around and talk all afternoon. Some of them sleep. Some of them go out and play basketball. They do it as a ritual. And, and weddings are rituals, aren't they? Holiday celebrations are rituals. Everybody knows when the holiday is coming, and they get prepared for that. Uh, weddings especially are elaborate events because they signify and give significance to the love of the couple forming a new home. Why go through all that wedding process? Why not just go down to the justice of peace, get it over with, and go on with your life? Some people do that. Nothing wrong with that. It'd be very easy to do. But why do people have these big elaborate weddings? Because that's a significant statement about the love of the couple. And the wedding, the Christian wedding, brings God into the picture and lets us know that he has brought this couple together he is going to sustain this couple in their wedding and marriage. And he is the one that will sustain their love over time. And so we have these, these elaborate rituals in weddings to signify that love of the couple, making a new home. And, and so we have religious rit rituals. And these pass on meaning and the experience of faith. Rituals help us understand our faith. But as we perform those rituals... It help, helps us increase our faith. So it's not only an intellectual thing, it's an emotional thing. For instance, we don't just intellectually sing songs, do we? Do we? I mean, you could take your hymn book out and just read the poem. But you don't do that. What do you do? You sing it. And by singing that, you embrace it. And you become part of that. Become part of the melody. Become part of the words. And because of the faith that's demonstrated... Through that song, you're expressing praise to God, and God himself is expressing love to you, and your faith is increased as a result because you're experiencing the ritual you're going through. And that's what Christian rituals are all about. They enable us to express our love to God and allow God to express his grace to us. So Christian rituals are important. And, and that brings us back to our text for the day and the story of Esther and Mordecai and uh, Haman and, and King Xerxes. And you remember what happened when Haman uh, tried to get Xerxes to have all the Jews annihilated. And, and Mordecai worked with Esther to get her to get the king's attention, to try to get this edict removed. And eventually it did. It backfired on Haman. And Haman himself was hanged instead of the Jewish people. And uh, the edict was reversed by the king's order, and the Jews were able to defend themselves. And so as a part of that uh, celebration, when the victory came, they, they created a new holiday. They created a new event. They created a new ritual that the Jewish people are to follow. And that event was called Purim, which Jews still practice to this day. Now, I don't know the exact date this past year, but next year Purim will be celebrated by the Jews on March the 15th. And it's done every year by the Jewish people. So let's use uh, Purim to see why ritual is important. Because not only was Purim important to the Jews, but we have rituals that are important to us. 
not the least of which is the one we're going to be a, taking part of this morning. Well, first of all, ritual brings order out of chaos. Ritual brings order out of chaos. Uh, it, life is just chaotic. Life goes on. It continues to move. Sometimes it moves faster than we can keep up with. But rituals help us to slow the pace of life down. They help us to attach meaning and significance to life. They help us to bring order into our lives. They give structure to our daily being. That's why rituals are so important. They bring order out of the chaos, and, and, and that's a good thing. Now, Purim was founded after a time of chaos and confusion for the Jewish people. Remember that, because uh, the edict had gone out from Xerxes before he knew better that the Jewish people would all be destroyed, because Haman uh, had the king write it that way. But Esther and Mordecai were able to stop Haman and have the king reverse the order. So he sent out another edict, and that edict said that the Jews would be allowed to arm themselves, and the Jews would be able to defend themselves, and uh, they, they set the day that that would take place. Uh, it was a time of great chaos and confusion. The, the scripture tells us that Mordecai sat in the gates mourning and fasting uh, with ashes and sackcloth, and, and he was grieving over the, the fact that Jewish people were going to be annihilated. And, and how was how are they going to get out of this? Well, God provided a way through uh, Esther boldly going into the king and, and appealing for her people and taking care of the problem of uh, Haman. But it was a great time of confusion and chaos for the Jewish people. Now notice what it says in the scripture in verses 23 and 20 through 26. It says, So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the fur, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word Pur. What happened? What happened was this. The Jews were able to defend themselves and they were overwhelmed with joy. And Mordecai says, we have to commemorate this. We have to remember this. We have to celebrate this. So they established this new festival, this new feast, this new day of celebration, this new ritual and custom in the Jewish faith. And they called it Pur. Now Pur was, was a lot. And they would throw the lots and that would give them uh, you know, answers to their questions that they might have. Evidently Haman had cast the lots to find out the date in which the Jews were going to be annihilated. And so uh, God overruled the activity of chance. God, remember, works through the activity of providence, as we've talked about before. And God overruled the purr and changed it into something that was a victory for the Jewish people. So uh, using what God did, they said, well, let's just call the festival Purim because God is in control even of the dice. He's in charge of all of our lives. And so they established this new festival called Purim. Now, that's important for us to know because here was a new event, a new custom that was established so they could commemorate what God had done in their lives. And they could bring order to their lives because every year they would remind themselves it's not chance, it's not kings, it's not evil people who are in control. God is in control of our lives. And every year they celebrate that when they celebrate Purim. That's why rituals are so important. Yearly and weekly rituals enable us to mark time, rest, and celebrate life. That's what rituals do for us. They help us to mark time. For instance, when is Christmas? When? Oh, you just marked time, didn't you? Mm-hmm. When is uh, our Independence Day? Oh, you just marked time, didn't you? You see how rituals, festivals, events like that, holidays, they help us to mark time. We know what's coming forward. It's not just a bunch of senseless chaos. We have marked time. We know where we're going and what's coming up. And, and Purim was that for the Jewish people. We have that each Sunday morning, don't we? 
uh, in the Bible, it talks about remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Jewish people celebrate on Saturday. We celebrate on Sunday as a reminder of the resurrection of our Lord on the first day of the week. And so we have this weekly reminder every seven days that we need to worship God, that our life just isn't our own, that there's someone that gives us life, and we rest from all of our activity, and we let creation rest, and we take time just to reflect on our lives, celebrate our family, celebrate our church and our worship companions, and celebrate the God who makes it all possible. That's an important ritual that we go through. It helps us to rest. It helps us to celebrate life. Did you know they've done all kinds of scientific studies now? And here's what they found. That people who worship and pray have fewer health problems. They have fewer divorces. And they live longer. And they have happier lives. And their children are not as at risk as other children. Now, that's not the Bible telling us that. That's what scientists have discovered as they've researched this over time. Why is that? Because God designed life in such a way we need to take time for ritual. We need to take time for rest. We need to put a pattern into our lives, a rhythm into our lives. You can do that on a daily basis with your private devotion time. You can do that on a weekly basis with your worship time. You can do that on a yearly basis when you follow the church calendar throughout the year. You see, God gives us a rhythm that we can uh, fulfill our lives with and allow us to keep from the insanity of the world around us. So ritual brings order out of chaos. But also ritual memorializes important events. It memorializes important events. Now, now we've already talked about the 4th of July. That was an important historical event, wasn't it? That's when we signed the Declaration of Independence. That's when we as a, a country said we're no longer going to be under Britain's rule. And so every year, the 4th of July, we celebrate that. And we as a, a, as a people remember that historical event. And we do it big. We celebrate big. This year, our family went over to St. Augustine. And we sat out there on the lawn by, by the, uh, the fort over there. And we watched the fireworks go off. And it was a wonderful fireworks display. And we didn't, weren't doing that just because of the fireworks. We were doing that as a commemoration of something that had happened years ago on the 4th of July, a celebration of our independence. And so rituals like that memorialize important events. Well, Purim forever marks the days of the Jews' deliverance. Purim marks the days of the Jews' deliverance. Uh, over, the scripture tells us they took two days for different reasons, but uh, the peop Jewish people still celebrate those two days when they talk about Purim. And they remind themselves that God had delivered them. It was a historical event, and, and it continues to this day. And those that uh, say, well, this isn't true, the Bible just telling a story and all that, that's sense nonsensical because why would people continue to celebrate something it has no basis in fact. Purim was the deliverance of God, and they celebrate that historical fact. Notice what it says here in the scripture in verses 1 through 5. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews struck down all their enemies with a sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. The Jews were able to defend themselves, they defeated their enemies, and they celebrated that through this festival of Purim. Sometimes what seems to be a, a terrible event suddenly becomes an event that we can celebrate and memorialize. Did you know that... Um, this is an interesting story. Uh, there's a small town in Alabama. Uh, it's uh, Enterprise, Alabama. And one year, the farmers of the uh, area were expecting a big bumper crop of cotton. And uh, something happened. This little insect called the boll weevil came along. And he invaded and destroyed the 
bumper crop and the economy of the entire town. But uh, the farmers decided they weren't going to be defeated by the bull weevil. So instead, they decided to plant peanuts instead of cotton. And the result of that was is that the uh, idea caught on and the whole economy of the area survived. And now they're the bi biggest peanut producing area in the country. And so uh, something that had been such a horrible event in their lives now suddenly became a blessing from God because they were able to stop raising cotton and raise peanuts and allow the economy to recover. Well, you know what they did? They're in Enterprise, Alabama. If you go there today, if you come into town, you'll see this big monument. You know what the monument's of? The bull weevil. The bull weevil. Not because the bull weevil was a good thing, but because the bull weevil forced them into raising other crops that brought prosperity to their area. And so sometimes these events of chaos and confusion, sometimes these things that seem to be, be there for our harm suddenly turn around to be blessings for us. And we need to celebrate those. And that's exactly what these Jewish people did. The Purim, that, that object of chance that set a date in which they were going to be annihilated, suddenly God transformed that into a time of blessing and deliverance. And so they memorialized it through this festival of Purim. So we have other things that we memorialize, other rituals we perform that are religious-based. For instance, Passover. The Jewish people celebrate Passover. It marks their deliverance, their exodus from Egypt. Uh, we, we have Christmas. It marks the birth of Christ, doesn't it? We have the Lord's Supper, marking Christ's death and burial. And we have Easter that marks Christ's death and resurrection. And so we make these rituals, these events, these feasts, these times of celebration, not because the event themselves might have been good, but because it helps us remember the blessings of God. That's why ritual is so important. It memorializes important events. But notice also that, that ritual unites a community together. It unites a community together. Now, Purim, as we said earlier, is a custom observed by the Jewish community every year around the world. They all celebrate this custom. Notice what it says in verses 27 through 28. The Jews took it on themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed at the appointed time. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. Notice the importance of keeping Purim. It's important because it reminds them of God's deliverance. And it brings the entire community together. How do you explain? We talked about this last week. How do you explain the Jewish people? This group of people has been so persecuted down through the years. Even by Christians, they've been persecuted. How do you explain the holding of that community together? Well, God is, is a good answer. But, but also the culture they share, the festivals they share, the traditions they share, the meeting together as a family and as a community to celebrate events like Purim and Passover. Those traditions have been handed down for generations and it continues to unite them together. All the other Semitic people have just kind of filtered away. They no longer have the old tribes, but they still have the Jewish people. They still have them celebrating Purim today after thousands of years. And so here we have this wonderful custom, and they're reminding themselves, do it every year. Keep our community together. You know, there's not too many uh, community events that holds us as the American people together. But, but Fourth of July is a pretty good one. Right? And uh, I can think of another one. Thanksgiving's a pretty good one, isn't it? 
where everybody takes time to just be thankful to God, to be thankful, and if you're not a, not a believer in any way, you at least be thankful for your family and your life and, and a few days off. But we take time to do that because it unites us as a community together. It brings us together as a people. And the United States does that, but, but we do that as churches also. Christians can become closer to regular observance of weekly and yearly rituals. How important is it to be in church on a Sunday? How important is it? It's very important. Not only because of the personal benefits you receive that I mentioned a few minutes ago, but also it unites us as a family. It keeps us together, supporting one another. When people go through hard times, we have someone that's going to be there for us. If you don't have that, that sustaining continuity of relationships that goes on in a church, then when life hits you hard, you're going to be all alone. But if you have that community of believers, if you have a support system that's there for you weekly, year in, year out, that family is going to surround you with love and support and encouragement. You can count on it. Because ritual unites us as a community together. Well, finally, ritual brings joy and celebration. Ritual brings joy and celebration. There was a spontaneous outburst of joy and celebration when the Jewish people overcame their enemies. They just jumped up and down, shouted to God, praised Him for His deliverance. It, it was a, a, a time of great rejoicing. That was just a spontaneous thing. You can imagine to think that you're going to die one day and then the next day know that you've been able to be delivered. What a, what a time of celebration that was. But how do you continue that joy? How do you maintain that? Well, you establish customs. You establish rituals that help you to remember, that help you to continually celebrate the victory that God has brought your way. And so Purim is a designated time for the Jewish people to enjoy God's providential care and rejoice in their victories. Purim is a constant reminder to them that providence guides this life, that God is in control. And so we can celebrate with joy knowing that He has our back. He cares for us and He will deliver us no matter what kind of problems we go through. If you had that kind of spirit, if you had that kind of mindset, just think what you could do. Matter of fact, just think what the Jewish people have done down through history in spite of all the Holocaust against them. And they continue to survive and prosper to this day because they believe in the providential care of God for his people. Notice what it says in verses 20 through 22. Mordecai recorded these events. He sent letters to all the Jews throughout the providence of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. It became a big celebration time, and it is to this day. Matter of fact, uh, during the Feast of Purim, when the Jewish people celebrate it, they, they kind of play role. They act it out. They read this out to uh, the families and, and congregations that's gathered. They read the whole story of Esther. And every time Haman's name comes up, all the people go, boo. And every time Mordecai's name comes up, everybody goes, yay. And they celebrate it. And they have a great time of feasting and joy. Matter of fact, they drink a lot too. But, but it's a time to remember God's victory. It's a time to celebrate what he had done for them. And, and so we too, we too have events and, and rituals that enable us to celebrate with joy. We too have events that were painful, but God turned them around and, and made them something wonderful. The Lord's Supper is one of those events. The Lord's Supper is commemorating Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death. How can you celebrate that? 
We celebrate that because he was raised. He died for our sins, but God didn't leave him there in the ground. God raised him from the grave. And now we can have eternal life through him. And so this memorial, this time around the Lord's table, is a time of joy. Because death didn't have the victory. God had the victory. Amen? And so when we partake of this, we partake in this ritual because it commemorates what God has done for us spiritually and as the people of God. Several years ago, there was an earthquake in Armenia. And uh, a lady was trapped under a big slab of concrete for five days. Next to her was a little baby. It wasn't her baby. The mother had been killed. But the little baby was there, and, and the woman was nearby, and, and the baby was crying because it was hungry and thirsty. And, and so the woman who had been injured, she had a cut on her lip. She would pull the baby up to her, and that baby would gnaw on her lip. And that baby would suck that blood from her lip. And then after five days, the rescuers found them and pulled them out. And both the baby and the mother survived. That woman was literally the blood of life for that baby. She literally was the bread of life for that baby. That's what Jesus is for us. When we come and partake of the, the wine and the bread... What we're doing is partaking of that which sustains. Partaking of what Christ has done for us on the cross. We're receiving his lifeblood. We're receiving the bread of life that gives us hope and purpose and meaning. We're receiving the sustenance that keeps us going as God's people. That's why we celebrate this, to remind ourselves. You see, Christians need a time to celebrate God's goodness and, and break from the mundane and routine cares of this world. And the Lord's Supper is one of those things that we do to remind ourselves of who we are, what Christ has done, and how we can celebrate his life. I read a story this week about a lady named Terrell, Terry Edelship. And Tara was a, a lady who had married her husband and... Uh, having a baby and and the husband suddenly came down with an illness and he died the same week that he died she miscarried the baby and so she lost baby and hus husband in a matter of seven days devastated her life she had grown up with a Jewish father and a, a Lutheran mother she didn't really go to church anywhere didn't have much faith belief and so she kind of just floated and she kind of just was gloomy, and she didn't know how to handle what had been going on in her life. But uh, for, for one reason or another, for various reasons, she went back to church, and, and uh, there, as she went back to church, she was, she was kind of forced in the situation. She didn't want to be the only one left in the pew. She was kind of forced to come around and, and partake of the Lord's table, take, partake of the Lord's supper. And as she decided if she was going to receive the communion or not, she made the decision that maybe in Christ is my hope. And she took communion that day and started renewing her faith in Christ. Well, she found out um, several years later that um, there was a group in Massachusetts that had heard about her situation. And uh, her friend, uh, Ora, had asked the church there to pray for Tara. And so Ora... Uh, shared that information, and, and so on a regular basis, uh, the church there, uh, especially one lady named Liz and another man named Jeff, uh, would ask for prayer for Tara, help her during this difficult time. And uh, that took place. Uh, Liz went on back to England. Um, then uh, she uh, was never heard from again. Uh, Aura uh, invited her friend to come and move up there, and so Tara moved up there. In the meantime, she had married, and uh, they had gone to Massachusetts, and her husband was working at Harvard, and uh, so they uh, began to de develop their home, and uh, one day, uh, Aura was saying, you know, uh, uh, my friend uh, Liz went, that went back to England. She was asking about you, and uh, I told her that you've gotten married and to a guy named Jeff, and 
uh, you are um, doing well and you're recovering and having children now. And, and uh, she was just overwhelmed. And, and she said, but Ora said, what was the guy she married? Well, his name was Jeff. Jeff so-and-so? Yeah. That's who, how did you know he married her? She married him. And Ora said, well, that's the Jeff that stood up in the church and asked for prayer for Tara. Well, I didn't know that. Well, as Tara was telling this story to her prayer group about six years later, suddenly three of the women in the group go, well, I was there. I was praying for you too. You're the one we were praying for? And so suddenly Tara finds out that God had arranged things in such a way that the man she married and the three out of the five people in her Bible study prayer group were all praying for her, and she didn't even know them until years later. Isn't that an amazing thing? Here's what she says. She says, piecing it all together, I wept and wept, unable to imagine the grace of it all. In 1997, when I was an agnostic widow living in New Jersey, a group of Christians in Massachusetts had been praying for me. And while my own attempts to find a faith never adequately explained my conversion, this did. I had been prayed into the kingdom. Now, the important thing about that story is this. It's a marvelous story about how God works. But I want you to know something. What if nobody had been at church practicing the weekly worship? They would never know about Tara. What if nobody had prayed, practicing a Christian ritual? God would never have heard their prayers for Tara. What if Tara had never partaken of the Lord's Supper and been forced to participate? She would never come back to Christ. Here's my point. Rituals are life. Rituals provide us a way in which to communicate with God and a way in which he can show his grace to us. And so rituals open the door to experience God in fresh ways. This morning I invite you to partake in this ritual and experience God in a fresh new way. Let's pray together. As we close this morning, Father, the invitation is open to come and receive the salvation that only you can give. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You shed your blood. You gave your life on that cross, so we might know forgiveness of sin and eternal salvation. I pray, Father, if there's one here today that's never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, that this will be their time to say yes to him. I pray for others here, Father, who are struggling and wondering about the overwhelming nature of life and wondering if they can make it through. I pray, Father, that they'll come back to the table and once again know that you not only know what's going on in their lives, but you gave your very life's blood for them. And they can draw from you all the resources they need. So bless us now, Father, as we celebrate around your table. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together and sing our hymn of invitation. This is your opportunity to come and pray at the altar and prepare your hearts. Whatever God is saying to you this morning, as we stand and sing, you come, you come. Do what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about.